Rowan Hill was an extremely influential figure in 19th century England. Remember not only for his significant contributions to the evangelical movement, but also for pioneering efforts in social reform and education. Central to his legacy is the Surrey Chapel, a beacon of spiritual and societal transformation in London. Born in 1744, Roland Hill became a prominent preacher within the Calvinistic Methodist tradition. His sermons attracted large congregations, drawing attention to his charismatic and persuasive preaching. Hill's style was renowned for its accessibility and clarity, making religious teachings more comprehensible and appealing to the masses. In 1783, Roland Hill founded Surrey Chapel in Southwark, London, which quickly became a focal point for evangelical activities in the city. Beyond its role as a place of worship, Surrey Chapel embodied Hill's commitment to social justice and community service. He was deeply concerned with the plight of the poor and marginalized, and under his guidance, Surrey Chapel became a hub for philanthropic endeavors. One of the most notable contributions of Surrey Chapel was in the field of education. Hill established Sunday schools within the chapel, providing basic education to children who otherwise had limited access to schooling, and these Sunday schools not only taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also instilled moral values and principles from Scripture. Surrey Chapel was built as a ring. It was round in shape so that Roland Hill could be easily seen by everybody. Nobody is superior to somebody else. And also, Hill said, it's round so that the devil has no place to hide. Unfortunately, today, while Surrey Chapel no longer stands in its original form, Roland Hill's legacy lives on through the principles of faith, social responsibility, and service that he exemplified. His life and work continue to inspire individuals and communities to strive for positive change and to uphold the values of compassion and justice in a rapidly changing world. Unfortunately, Surrey Chapel became a ring. Remember the ring church? A ring for boxing, and for uh, like a gymnasium, and today is simply a pub. It's very sad to see that. Uh, that's a church that was so cutting edge, so contemporary, so impactful, such a long period of time is now all but gone. But the concepts, the ideas behind Surrey Chapel, the ring, Roland Hill still continue. As you saw in the video just a few moments ago, Roland Hill's church, the ring, I wanted to go there. It was hard to find, and Nicole was sick of me dragging her all over London. I said, I know where it is. We just got to find it. I know where it is. I've been studying this church for 20-some years. I've read Roland Hill's biography. A lot of things we do here are modeled after people like that. People don't know about who they are, but that's who we model after. I said, I want to go. I want to find it, and we did. We finally found it. And of course, I knew it was a pub. Uh, it has been for many years. And prior to that, it became a boxing ring. And it's so tragic that this church that was so powerful. But listen to what Roland Hill once said. He said, no churches are empty where the doctrines of the Reformation are duly urged with purity and energy upon the people's minds. Doctrine of the Reformation, that we are saved by grace through faith, through Jesus Christ alone. Those are those doctrines. He said when they are preached with, with purity and energy, the churches cannot be empty. And he said that almost 200 years ago. And that fact is still true today. We're in our series through the book of Judges, and we come to that portion that deals with the same problem, and to keep our Old West imagery, our message is called bullheaded, because we get bullheaded. We get stuck in our ways, and we make the same mistakes that others have made before us. You have your Bibles, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 2 and verse 11. Judges, chapter 2 and verse 11. As you're looking for this passage, God wants us to worship Him and Him alone. Turning to false gods angers Him and brings his judgment on us. Repentance through the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer. 
And also God has entrusted us to teach our younger generation to follow him as well. So it's not just, I know Jesus, I know where I'm going. No, I have a responsibility to teach the next generation. Judges chapter 2, verse 11. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, why did the children of Israel provoke the Lord to anger? They provoked him by serving the Baals and other gods and bowing down to them. And why did they bow down to Baal and all these other gods of the peoples? Listen to Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, when all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Another generation arose that did not know the Lord. Now, we usually sort of zip past that and we move on to the next verse. And we talk about the sin and we talk about God's judgment, and we talk about repentance and all that. I want us to pause there for a moment. Why did this another generation arise that did not know the Lord? How could this happen? There are two main sources from where children get their knowledge of God. The first is the home, and the second is the church. The home. The home is the place from moms and dads, they learn what it means to follow God. The home is the place where they learn how they need Jesus Christ in their lives. The home is the place where they learn the word of God, what is right, what is wrong, and what God desires from us. The home is the place where they learn how to live in society. One of the biggest problems in our world today, especially in the West, is that the home has fallen apart. It's not just falling apart, it has fallen apart. You see, God had told his people, teach your children. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you know this passage very well. He said, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. means first, just like they say on the planes, when the masks come down, put on your own mask first before you help your children. So also with us, you cannot teach your children to walk with Jesus if you don't walk with Jesus. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We don't have time to dwell on this because I want to move further on. Could it be that these people, when they got into the land with Joshua, they were so busy fighting for the Lord... They were so busy fighting against the enemies, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Hittites, and all these people, that in the process they forgot to teach their own children. Sometimes we can be so active in church, so busy serving in church, that in the process we forget that we still need to sit down and teach our children the things of God. Nicole and I, we have made that mistake at times, and we had to stop and say, we need to talk to our kids. We need to have dinner time. We need to teach them the things of God. Now, let me also warn you, there is the opposite extreme where people do absolutely zero when it comes to church. Your kids never saw you serve in church. Guess what? They will never serve in church. 
You have to model it for them. When they see you serving God in church, guess what happens? They see if mom and dad do it, I need to do it as well. So there is a balance. Don't be serving God so much that you don't take the time to talk to your kids and say, wait, we got to teach them. But don't be on the other extreme saying, we're just a family thing. We, we just love our family and this is what we do. And you have zero of church. Listen, the harvest is coming. I'm going to go and warn you. You may be the best parent in the world. You may have given them the best life. And yet something very vital is missing. And what's missing is church life. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I don't tell you and warn you now to make some changes. Balance. So home is the place where they learn, but also the church. The church. Now, in the context of the people of Israel, the Levites were to teach the people. They were to teach the young generation the things of God. Maybe the Levites were too busy setting up the tabernacle. Maybe they were too busy preparing the people for the next battle. So they forgot to teach the young generation. Listen to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. Don't be intoxicated. Don't drink. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that, listen, and that you may teach the children of Israel, all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. The Levites were supposed to teach the people. So if there is a generation that rises up that does not know God, could it be that the Levites didn't do their job? You know, the Levites were supposed to be like a husband to the bride. The bride are the people. As a husband to the bride, they were supposed to teach. They were supposed to guard. They were supposed to provide. And the Levites failed. You know, as a pastor, that is part of, a big part of my job is to teach, is to guide. If I fail there, it's not just about building a big church or being known, or having all these ministries. It's also teaching people, teaching the young generation. This is what Levites were supposed to do. This is what a pastor or the pastoral team is supposed to do, along with the volunteers, along with the leadership of the church. We are to teach. I'm going to step out on a limb here a little bit and say this. I'm saddened at how many pastors are unaware of the issues going on in our world. And you find that out when they make comments on social media on what's happening. You find that out when they say things. You know, the past week was such a turmoil at the Olympic Games, whether it was the opening ceremonies or the boxing match. And and there were pastors who spoke out, and I was so proud of them. I was like, yes, yes. I don't always comment. I support your comments. I can comment, but most times I want to share your posts. I want to come and like your posts. Why? Because they will listen to you faster than they'll listen to me. So I want to support you. But then there are times pastors spoke out and I said, wow, you should have been silent at that point. I did my research and there was no problem. It's like, oh my goodness. You see, The Levites also failed. And is it any wonder that the flock is scattered and gone into spiritual adultery? And what was the result? Listen to Judges chapter 2, verse 13. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Who or what is this Baal and the Ashtoreths? So Baal was the Canaanite god of storm and fertility. We find information about Baal in the Ugaritic texts. It was believed that the fertility of the land came from the rain that was supplied by Baal. 
in a stele, which is like a, like a big gravestone, Baal is depicted standing on top of the mountains or clouds with a club in his right hand and a lance in his left hand. His torso is made in a form of a tree or a lightning, means he is the God of nature. He provides rain. He fought, fought against the sea. Yam is another God. So there is this myth about Baal fighting against the sea God and bringing fertility over the land. Some of the titles for Baal were the Victor Baal, or the Rider of the Clouds, or the Prince Lord of the Earth. This is Baal. Astereth. Astereth, or Astart, was a consort. Consort means like a wife of a god, who is also a goddess, by the way. A companion of Baal. One of the companions of Baal was Ashtoreth. This goddess named Ashtoreth. She is referred to as the queen of heaven. If you read the book of Jeremiah, the women, the Israelite women made cakes of bread, burned incense, and poured out drink offerings to Ashtoreth. She is also the goddess of fertility. She was responsible for making the land fertile. She was responsible for multiplying the flocks. Whether it's sheep or cattle, you look to the god, goddess Ashtart, Ashtoreth, for bringing fertility. She is referred to as the Astart of the field. Very popular in the Phoenician world. You see, this baal Ashtoreth religion was simply a way to give power to nature. Baal was the male and Ashtart was the female. So the, the, the Canaanite people believed that the male and the female came together in this sexual relationship and creatures were born. They came together in this sexual relationship, and now you also can be fertile. You can have children. You can have uh, uh, greenery. You can have more f animals. This Baal Ashtart religion. Now, uh, the philosophers among the Canaanites knew better. They knew that there's no sexual relationship happening. They, they believed that it's more like the sun interacts with the sea, like a spark of sun hits the sea, the primordial sea, the yam sea. Remember Baal and yam fighting? And in the process, this life is born. And that life develops. And if you look to the sun god, and if you look to the mud of the earth, somehow you, you're going to have more life. So you got to keep them both happy the God of the sun and the God of the earth. For the philosophers, the sun and the sea, these are the natures. You have to keep them happy. You got to keep stimulating them. I hope you're catching on. You have to keep stimulating them. As you stimulate them, as you sort of make them come alive, then they will bless you. They will give you what you need. Of course, this contradicted the Bible. What does the Bible say? In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Everything was made by him. Everything was sustained by him. In fact, God also said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 13, he said, uh, it, Moses said, and God will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. Means God made everything and he's also going to multiply everything for you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. So uh, there shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. So God's people, listen, stay with me. As we submit to God, God blesses. According to the Baal Ashtoreth religion, man is in charge of nature. And nature has to be stimulated. And when nature is stimulated, it gives you what you want. Don't miss this. 
For believers, we bow to God and he gives the blessing. For Baal Ashtoreth religion, you have to stimulate nature and the nature gives you what you need. So uh, think about Elijah. Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? What did they do? Remember the two sacrifices? They cut up the bull, they put them on the altar, and then they prayed to their gods. They prayed from morning till noon. And when it didn't happen, what did they do? What was the next step? They began to cut themselves till blood was gushing out. What were they doing? They're trying to stimulate nature to send fire from heaven. And it didn't happen. You know, the Canaanites also try to stimulate nature by um, sacrificing their children to the god Molech, part of the same pantheon. So God is not answering. There are no rains coming. We got to kill some little babies and burn them. We're going to stimulate nature in the process. You don't need to miss this. I really pray this morning that God will keep you awake and keep you locked in because this is life-changing. We believe in submission to the living, true, triune God. They believe, on the other hand, to stimulating nature. And sometimes you have to stimulate nature, especially with fertility, through chaotic sexual orgies. Chaotic sexual. That's why they had prostitution, sacred prostitutions at the temple of Baal. And guess what God's people were doing? Oh, yes, they believed in God. Yes, they believed in the living true God and how he rescued them, but they felt like we also got to do this. We need to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who's going to send his son one day, but also we got to keep the Baal Asterith happy. So time to time we go over there and we stimulate nature. By the way, this is no different today. We are also trying to stimulate nature to get what we want. Don't misunderstand. We can harness nature for our benefit. Amen. We can learn from science. Science can help us find cures for sicknesses. Science can make us life, our life easier. For example, right now you're sitting in this room. Uh, Yesterday was very hot. Today is sort of okay, but we have air condition. It's part of science. We have light. Great. We have harnessed energy for our benefit. But listen, don't miss this. On the other hand, in secular humanism, we are trying to stimulate nature so that we can evolve to a better state. In this situation, nature is the author of life and nature is the source of all good gifts. Science can make us better people. I'm not anti-science. I was a science teacher. I'm not against science. In fact, some of the best Christians out there, uh, uh, best scientists out there are Christians in history and today. I'm not against science, but this philosophy that begins to worship nature, that believes that nature is the author of life and nature is the source of all good gifts and nature can also make us better. And even allow us to achieve states that were previously thought impossible. You're doing such a great job listening. So if in previous years people told you there's only male and female, science is helping us cross certain boundaries. Where it's whatever gender you choose you can have. Folks, there's absolutely nothing under the sun that is new. What we're dealing with today is the old Baal Ashtoreth religion coming back. It's secular humanism that stimulates nature to make us evolve to a better place, to an ideal state. Now, something else very important to understand, this philosophy is very powerful. It's also applied to society. Just by stimulating society through social chaos, it is believed that we will reach a better place. 
social chaos in this world is not bad, according to them. You know what happened in the opening ceremonies? You can just say, well, you know, people are going to do what you... You need to stop and listen. It was done in your face. It was done, of course, to mock Christianity, but it was more than that. It was to jolt the world. It was to shock the world. I mean, where did you ever see something? Oh, my goodness. And it's not just the French people are watching. The whole world is watching. And you go, wow, what was that? Because it is believed that when you shock society, you shake things up. And in the shaking things up, you are able to get to a new ideal. Oh, yes, people are going to oppose this and people are going to shout and Christians are going to cry foul and all that's going to happen. But in the end, when the dust settles, we're going to have a new world. It's a way of thinking behind it that a lot of times we go, How, why in the world would you do that, right? How many of y'all said that? That was crazy. Why would you do something? It is done because of a philosophy behind it. It's a philosophy of secular humanism. Again, don't misunderstand. We learn from science. We discover through science, but we submit to God. We don't spend our lives making nature our God or trying to stimulate it to get new and better things. But this is a philosophy that worships nature. This is a philosophy that looks to nature to help us get to an ideal state. And to get to the ideal state, you have to stimulate it. And by the way, this philosophy has even crept into the church, where just by stimulating previously accepted doctrines, we can create chaos which will lead us to a better place. Oh, the Bible is the Word of God, inerrant inspired. Let's shock that. So sometimes you have even Christian authors and scholars and preachers saying things you go, wow, where, where did you get that? You know what they're doing? They're espousing a philosophy that comes from secular humanism that actually is the old Baelish start religion that says to shock it. Because in the process of shocking, that's where we get the phrase, shake things up. Shake things up. Now, <laughs> when you shake things up, nobody asks the question, are we really going to get something better or is it all going to all break? And most times what you end up is everything breaks up and it falls apart. But guess what secular humanists will say? That's better than what we had before. If you are truly a born-again person, you believe Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and life, you have to ask yourself your question, uh, have you bought into this secular humanistic lie? Unfortunately, the church has. Sometimes you even hear people say that in church. Oh, preacher, we got to shake things up. I'm like, oh, how would you like to do that? Who do you want to shock, us or God? What do you want to do? Because they're thinking our church is dead and dying and there is no life. So if we just shake things up, somehow we're going to get to an ideal state. And my solution is go to the Bible. The Bible tells us how to shake things up. It is by repentance. It's by returning to the fundamental truth of the gospel. It's by coming to Jesus Christ and submitting to him, not by stimulating the doctrines of faith. And what was the result? Listen to Judges chapter 2, verse 14. How did God take this stimulating the nature, behavior, and religion? It says in verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity. As the Lord had said and as the Lord has sworn to them and they were greatly distressed. The church is greatly distressed. The society is greatly distressed. Our world is greatly distressed. Because we're doing things contrary to what God has said. 
And it goes back to Romans chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1. I want to read some portions of this because this is what Paul was saying when he began this book, the book of Romans, or the letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> listen to verse 18. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Very similar to Judges chapter 2, verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Same here, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, and that is interesting, Paul immediately goes back to the whole creation. The Baal Ashtar religion was based on creation. Secular humanism today is based on creation. You know, evolution is simply somehow the sun sparked something way beneath the ocean's surface and a molecule was born. And then it replicated and replicated and today we have human beings. Nothing new, that's the Baal Ashtar philosophy. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, there is a God. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. By the way, ancient human beings bowed before these gods. We don't bow before them. We study them. So it's all about studying and speaking and writing about nature and evolution and how life evolves and how life can still evolve and we can get to a better state. So what did God do to this? Listen to this. This is Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Therefore, God also gave them up to, you can say it with me, uncleanness. And what did it look like? in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. How interesting it is that here we're talking about nature, but the repercussion is sexual immorality. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God also gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Here comes homosexuality. Interesting, isn't it? Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Now, what are those things that are not fitting? Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers. They plot things. Backbiters, haters of God, violent proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Here's a good one. Disobedient to parents. How interesting. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God and that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Just like the people of Israel who did not deny the living God, but accommodated this Baal Ashtoreth religion, we are doing the same thing. And what we have to do, we have to cry out against this old religion. We have to cry out against secular humanism in our culture. 
And when you cry out, guess what people are going to call you? You're such an old-fashioned person. You are so anti-science. You're just a stick in the mud. You're so hateful to people. So when you speak out and say, that's wrong, <laughs> this is worshiping nature, there's a problem with this, you're trying to stimulate nature to get to an ideal state, old problem, but God's going to deal with us, and I'm speaking out. They'll say, oh, you are so, so prejudiced. People say that to me, and I'm like, I'm, I'm like I am? All right, you need to get new glasses. We're not talking about race and and skin tone, folks. We're talking about if we believe that we came from Adam and Eve, there's only one problem, it's called sin. There's only one solution, it's called, it's called Jesus Christ. And God is holy and he will deal with sin. But he made a way through Jesus Christ. Come to him, be saved. Come to him and be forgiven. He's waiting to forgive. That's my gospel. I don't know what you have. That's your problem. You know, Roland Hill, the reason I liked him so much. He was often called an enthusiast. They say, he's crazy. I, I, like, I like some of those crazy preachers. And he replied, he said, because I am in earnest, men call me an enthusiast. But I'm not. Mine are the words of truth and soberness. When I first came into this part of the country, I was walking on yonder hill and I saw a gravel pit fall in and bury three human beings alive. I lifted up my voice for help so loud that I was heard in the town below at a distance of a mile. Help came and rescued two of the poor sufferers. No one called me an enthusiast then. And when I see eternal destruction ready to fall upon poor sinners and about to entomb them irrecoverably in an eternal mass of woe and call aloud on them to escape, shall I be called an enthusiast now? No sinner. I am not an enthusiast in so doing. I call on thee aloud to fly for refuge to the hope set before thee in the gospel of Jesus Christ. His church was packed, packed by common people. And he put that pulpit right in the middle. He said, I'm putting it right in the middle for two reasons. Number one, everybody can see me on the same level. You know, English society is very class-based. So if you are so-and-so, you, you sit up front. If you're so-and-so, you get a certain position. He said, no, in my church is going to be everybody. And this is, this is the late 17, early 1800s. And then he also said, the church is round, no edges, so the devil can't hide in it. This morning, as we go in our time of invitation, we need to repent. We need to understand what's happening in our culture, in our world, what is even happening in the church. We need to teach our children and our next generation. Don't be bullheaded. People say, oh, I like the old things. Well, you are a preservative, okay? God hasn't called us to be a preservative. We are called to hang on to those same old truths and reach our culture today in the way that is most relevant, most impactful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you like old things, you just like antiques. I'm not into that. I like antiques. I like old things, but that's not the gospel. That's not what we're talking about today. If you do not know Jesus Christ, come to him and be saved. And if you recognize there is a problem in our culture, come and pray for an awakening, for a revival, starting in our own lives, in our own homes.